evening, General Lieutenant General J. S. Suda Ji. Welcome how to. Are you, how are you? I'm doing sir. I'm doing very fine, sir. Thank you so much. And sorry for the inconvenience. Supposed hey, to start at six thirty, but here we are. I'm surprised to see a man with your physique. And the topic <laughs> that we have is surgical strike. Well, this is quite an amazing experience. And I'm sure this is going to be an experience of a lifetime for all of us. Hearing out Lieutenant General D.S. Huda, the man behind surgical strikes, Amrit Mahosa, 75 years of India's independence, Visual India Forum, you know, warmly welcomes the commander, Northern Command Chief, the man who handled surgical strikes, an historic moment uh, wherein India reverted or retaliated the nuisance of that rogue nation called Pakistan. A befitting reply at the behest of the Honorable Prime Minister and the current dispensation. <clears throat> and Dr. Doctor, uh, anyways, uh, let me come back to uh, Dr. General Huda Ji. Huda Ji, what exactly is a surgical strike? You may start from that and take us through the entire backdrop of what led to that kind of a, you know, important decision. It was probably an inflection point when it comes to India's external affairs strategy, defense strategy. Who better to tell us about this historic uh, thing that happened, historic, uh, you know, uh, situation or instance that happened, and uh, uh, you know, were we really successful? Were we really successful in denting or making a mark on the enemy landscape? And in the future, what are the learnings that you would like your successors to know from you? so that India stays prepared because we are not really surrounded by friends. And the global you know, equation is turning out or is changing very fast, very dynamically, as we are all aware of. Lieutenant General D.S. Huda, over to you. Surgical strikes, government of India. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, you know, inviting me to this show. <clears throat> uh, and as you said, you know, I'll just take you through uh, what happened in September 2016, you know, the events that proceeded to and then what led to what is now uh, famously being called, uh, you know, the surgical strikes of 2016. Uh, basically, what surgical strike means is, uh, you know, precise strikes, which are targeting uh, what you want without any collateral damage to civilians, etc. So the, the term generally used for air operations. So when you carry out the bombing, which is so surgical and so precise that you hit only a military target and without causing any damage to any surrounding civilian facilities. This term was also used because we did multiple strikes, very specifically on Pakistan terrorist launch pads. And it was very sort of, uh, you know, uh, no collateral damage, no damage to anybody else, uh, only directed at, at terrorist camp. So that's why this term surgical strike. But let me, uh, you know, take you back to uh, September 18th at Uri. Uh, Uri garrison is a garrison which is very close to the line of control uh, in Jammu and Kashmir. And on 18th September, some terrorists entered inside this garrison and caused a fair amount of mayhem uh, and, and casualties to our troops. Uh, what happened that day was, uh, uh, normally you would be aware that uh, units which are on the line of control generally spend about two years at the border and then they come out from there and they are replaced by another unit. So there is normally a two-year tenure. So what happened, unfortunately for us, that this was the day when one of the units was in the process of moving up to its uh, line of control position. And for that one night, they had Uri. This unit, say, let, let me say approximately 400 soldiers, 
had pitched tents and were living in those tents. So when these terrorists sneaked into that uh, Uri garrison that night, the first group that they came across were these soldiers sleeping in tents. And all were all together, 400 of them. Uh, and, the, and the terrorists fired, the tents all caught fire. Uh, and I recall getting, uh, you know, call in the morning on the, uh, on the 18th saying, uh, so we've had some casualties in Uri. Uh, and slowly as the day passed, the number of casualties just kept increasing. So initially in the morning, it was uh, five people have been martyred, then it was 10, then it was 15. By the time, you know, the terrorists were killed, we had lost 18 soldiers. That's a huge, huge number, uh, you know, in a single attack. And that evening, uh, the chief of the army staff, uh, Jal Dalbir Suhag and I, we flew to Uri, to the site of, you know, where the incident had taken place. Uh, and literally, uh, we were walking in uh, four inches of burnt uh, ash of the tents that had got burnt. And, you know, there was a, there was a real feeling of, uh, should I say, sorrow, but also anger in our hearts that, uh, you know, we've suffered so many casualties. And I think very quickly, uh, a decision was taken uh, both at the political and the military leadership levels that, listen, uh, this action of Pakistan of pushing in terrorists and causing so many casualties cannot go unpunished. I mean, that decision came, uh, I think, within 24 hours. That this needs to be done. Let us also look back uh, at 2016, uh, see, the, uh, from the start of the year, 2016 had been a troubled year. So, right in the beginning of the year, you had this terrorist attack on Pathan Court Air Base that happened in January 2016. Thereafter, Park sponsored violence. We had, uh, you know, this massive protest that broke out in, uh, uh, in Jammu and Kashmir after the killing of Buranwani. This again happened in 2016. And then we had this Ori attack. And so I think by then, uh, as they say, you know, the, the patience had sort of reached its peak and we said, look, uh, enough is enough. And now we need to do something. And we were also sort of conscious that, uh, look, whatever we needed to do, we needed to do it quickly. You can't react after three months and say, oh, look, this was in reaction to what Pakistan do, did to us in Ori. We needed to respond in an early manner, and which again was, you know, directions given by the government that uh, have a strong response and do it quickly. We were fortunate uh, in that uh, we had been uh, practicing for such a cross-border kind of operation uh, for almost a year. Otherwise, frankly, you know, to say that uh, you have the attack on 18th within 10 days, you are able to uh, launch such a complex operation across the border uh, is almost impossible. But as I said, we had been for one year planning and preparing for such an eventuality. Now, we didn't know when it will come, but the planning and preparation were going on. So, uh, satellite imagery of Pakistan terrorist camps, uh, the kind of routes that we would take to reach there, what is the kind of layout of these camps? All that information was being gathered over a period of one year. At the same time, we were also carrying out training. So our special forces uh, had been uh, preparing and planning for such a contingency where we might need to go across the border into Pakistan territory. As you know, the special forces are also employed quite a lot in counter-terrorist duties within Jammu and Kashmir. But we made a conscious effort in Northern Command and I was the Army Commander there. We made a conscious effort that apart from your counter-terrorist roles, uh, the special forces must be prepared for a cross-border operation. Because that is a more difficult sort of operation than, uh, you know, fighting sort of terrorists uh, internally. So we took that, we took approximately uh, one week after the uh, attack on our Uri garrison. <clears throat> we took that one week to, uh, you know, finalize our targets. 
that okay we had been uh, gathering information say for example of 10 camps uh, then we decided look now finally when we are going for this operation the surgical strike we will hit three four five whatever number of camps we had decided on so we had to finalize what those targets are uh, prepare a plan a detailed plan uh, for an attack on each target uh, we had to collect last minute information about those targets where we are going to uh, what can we expect what are the number of terrorists that we will find there all that information had to be collected uh, finally before we make our final plan uh, and another key thing was uh, selection of team members what will be the composition of each team that will go uh, so for example we had a mix of uh, you know, surveillance people, we had a mix of snipers, we had uh, medical personnel, uh, we had communication people who would handle the communication, we would have people who would actually go in for the assault, who would handle heavier weaponry. So, selection of the team, depending on what the target was and how you had to attack it, was also a very sort of key element in our preparation. Uh, going so six seven days uh, you know after the after 18 september uh, we took to sort of finalize our plans uh, so we were ready by about the 25th or <laughs> uh, 26th so the broad plan uh, and uh, i i really can't go into you know uh, uh, too many details about what was uh, you know uh, how and where we went in but let me broadly tell you what the plan was like so uh, broadly, the plan was that we would hit uh, multiple targets on one night. It was not that we were hitting one target, but we would hit on the night of 28th, 29th of uh, September, we would hit multiple targets across both the Jammu and the Kashmir region. Now, for those of you who have uh, uh, traveled to Jammu and Kashmir and seen Jammu area and Kashmir area, you know, the difference between Jammu and uh, Kashmir is quite a lot. And so when we were planning our targets, we were hitting targets both across the Jammu area, the Jammu region as they call it, and also across the Kashmir region. And because we planned to hit multiple targets on, on one night, it made the plan a little complex. You see, it would be simple if you do one target, you go in, do the operation and come out. When you have to do multiple targets on the same night, uh, it just it just complicates the whole plan because you are hitting different targets at different times of the night. Uh, the routes to go in and come out are are different for each different target. Uh, for example, uh, we hit the first target uh, in Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir. <laughs> Sorry, we hit the first target at midnight of 28 29 and the last target we hit was actually six hours later at six o'clock in the morning and that's uh, that's why i'm saying when you're hitting multiple targets uh, the plan becomes uh, you know a, a little more uh, a little more complex uh, in, in how you do this uh, so are you there amit or i have lost you somewhere? okay <laughs> so which is why i said the the plan became a little complex uh, but notwithstanding, I think uh, there was a great degree of confidence among uh, the soldiers who were to actually cross the line of control and go. The officers and soldiers who were actually to go were supremely, supremely confident that uh, they had everything they need. They had all the information. Uh, they were confident about their own training and their ability to be able to conduct this operation. <laughs> So 28th, uh, last light as we call it, uh, you know, when the sun goes down and darkness uh, comes in on 28th evening, uh, that's when these teams then went across, these multiple teams went across the line of control. Yeah, but uh, General Sir, uh, what, was the, what was the mode of uh, crossing over? Was it airborne? Because you started with <laughs> airborne, surgical strikes are airborne. And here in, no, no. what we understand is that they crossed a tunnel or something like that? No. So, 
uh, I said surgical strike is a term generally used for uh, you know carrying out airborne uh, attacks, uh, bombing, precision bombing. Uh, but uh, our operation was completely on foot. So, and in fact, uh, let me tell you the line of control where these soldiers went across is perhaps the most heavily guarded frontier in the world anywhere. You have Pakistani troops and Indian troops literally, uh, as they say, in eyeball contact and very big deployment of soldiers on both sides. Uh, but despite that, uh, you know, uh, these people managed to infiltrate across, uh, cross the forward line of Pakistani force, go behind them, get to the Pakistan terror launch pads, strike you know, them. Sir, you know, sorry to interrupt, but back. you know, since uh, I know, you know, uh, in case you wish to answer my uh, quick query or uh, queries or my curiosity, you may. Otherwise, you may choose not to. You know what? No, no, sure. There was a movie, uh, uh, Uri. Uri. There was a movie called Uri which was made on the incident. Uh, how's the Josh and all that, you know? It's all fine for a movie, but what perplexed me, and it still perplexes me, and now I'm all the more perplexed to uh, fathom out as to how come in such a heavily guarded boundary border, LOC, I mean, just overnight, our troops in that sensitive zone and situation could cross over. Is it that, is it that uh, pervious? Is it that possible? No, no, let me tell you. Uh, so this is a question that is that is often asked. Uh, I mean, just crossing those uh, forward tier takes so much time and patience to be able to, you know, sneak across. So we had to recce uh, where are the routes. Now, fortunately, you know, that's a hilly area. So it's not as if it's completely plain. So it is a hilly area, so you do find some holes in the ground, you find some small rivulets. So routes to cross the Pakistani forward post and to cross, there are minefields there, to cross the minefields. I mean, that planning itself was so detailed as to how you would go, how many people would go, what would be the tactics that you would follow. And frankly, um, our worry was not so much the going part because, uh, you know, uh, surprise was there. The Pakistanis didn't know when we will come or what time we will come. Our problem was coming back because once you have gone across and you fired and you caused so much destruction and mayhem in the rear of Pakistani position, from there to then come back safely across was, uh, you know, another another big challenge. So different routes had to be selected. You will go in by this route. You will come back by this route. Various contingencies were planned. What happens what, if somebody? What was, the distance, what was the distance that was covered inside the Pakistan POK? So 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 it depends uh, because there were different targets. So we went in about four to five kilometers inside. And then we had to, as I said, come back and contingencies were, were made that, look, in case some group gets into trouble, then what would you do? How would you rescue them? How would you make sure they come out? So very detailed planning had been done for all these contingencies. And these are, these are superbly trained uh, soldiers, frankly. I think these special forces are outstanding. I think in terms of their ability, in terms of their training, uh, I think they are a match to any special forces in the world. If there is something that is lacking, I may say it's the equipment. I mean, they don't have the kind of equipment, for example, which the American SEALs, etc. would have. But they are getting those. Uh, but in, in terms of um, physical capability, man to man, I think they are, they are absolutely outstanding. And they're trained to do that. I mean, and uh, everyone came back and everyone came back unscathed, not a single casualty, if uh, records suggest. Yeah, so uh, to me, that was, uh, should I say, the biggest measure of success. That people went, they carried out their operation successfully, 
and everybody came back uh, you know safely in fact as i said you know we were sitting in our uh, in our operations room and we had these drones or uavs as we call them up in the air and so we were watching the target area now you couldn't exactly make out what is happening because from that much up in the air you can only make out some figures on the ground etc uh, but we did know that the operation was largely proceeding as planned as i said our big concern was see the first uh, first attack went in at around uh, 12 pm midnight and the last attack was to go in 6 hours later so we were uh, sort of quite concerned that you know in this 6 hour period the pakistani forces will get alerted message will be passed to everybody so that by the time our time comes to launch the last attack maybe you know they would all be alert and the attack would become so much more difficult but fortunately uh, <laughs> i mean they were they were completely surprised uh, the pakistani so they didn't really react so after all that uh, to carry out this operation for each party to come back uh, safe and secure uh, as i said i think if you ask me uh, yes we did uh, cause casualties we did send a strong message to pakistan uh, but one major success also was that look everybody has managed to come back safely because if we had had casualties no doubt we would have still celebrated the success of the surgical strike but we would also mourn the loss of our soldiers which fortunately we did not have to do and which is why i say to me at that moment when i got to know that everybody is back safe there was a huge sort of sense of uh, you know relief in my in my own head uh, <clears throat> so if you ask me very frankly you know who deserves uh, the greatest share of praise for this operation i will unhesitatingly say uh, the soldiers and the officers who went across the line of control uh, as we have spoken it's one of the most heavily guarded frontiers in the world these people had put their lives on line not a single person said uh, look the operation is very difficult i will not go there was no hesitation on anybody's face that uh, you know they are going into this and frankly Uh, today we can say look everybody came back safe but the fact is it was a real life threatening situation when these people had gone uh, inside and across into enemy territory uh, so if you ask me i think these are the sort of uh, the real heroes of uh, of this operation and uh, uh, you know my my sort of hat off hats off to them that uh, the manner in which they they carried out the operation uh people also ask you know so what was achieved now you carried out the surgical strike uh, i think uh, i think the one big thing was uh, that listen we have sent out a message to pakistan that if you carry out terrorist activities in india there will be costs to pay and i think that message went out uh, loud and clear uh it's not as if we are going to remain sort of defensive and i think in some ways that message was also reinforced with the 2019 uh, balakot air strike that listen uh, we are willing to take risks uh, but do not think your actions are going to go sort of unpunished to me that was the big message that we needed to send Uh, it isn't as if uh, we were expecting suddenly that pakistan will stop doing all terrorist activities in jammu and kashmir that would have been impractical to even think like that but yes to tell them uh, there is going to be a cost we are willing to up the ante and we are willing to uh, you know take the take the fight to the next level that was i think the one big <clears> message in that, uh, also, that went out this is a little different i'm sure we'll have uh, your count your uh, uh, colleague joining us the show in a couple of days with respect to this bala court thing as well abhinandan also i will be asking to probably probably he will not be joining because of the security reasons but the pakistanis did manage to put him down and also they had the next day itself an helicopter 
which they shot down in the Balakot case when they retaliated through the PEF. Now, uh, it's like one-upmanship or is it like I was, is it like, you know, is a, you know, just a kind of, a, you, know, you know, whisking away with a little bit of, you know, risk or a little bit of fear psychosis that you're playing. I mean, did it really matter to these guys, uh, these shameless guys, this kind of a surgical strike? Because what was the ramification or what was the reaction was something like uh, expected, but has there been any change in the patterns, in the uh, behavioral patterns, security patterns of the Pakistanis uh, after this surgical strike? So, you know, you asked me this question uh, right at the beginning of the show, uh, when you said, so what are the lessons that we learned from here? <coughs> I know for certain, uh, being there, and, uh, you know, sort of we were, uh, we used to listen to uh, radio communications coming out of uh, Pakistan army uh, and see what these people are talking. Uh, and let me tell you that uh, there was a fair amount of uh, sort of fear and panic after the surgical strike. That this is what has happened and, you know, there would be like, uh, be alert, the Indian army will do one more like this. So in some ways, it is a psychological victory. On your question of whether this one surgical strike is going to change attitudes in uh, in Pakistan, surely not. And I don't I don't think we should. We have fought we have fought four wars with them. We fought Kargil. As you said, it, there was a there was a peer psychosis created. There was a dent in their confidence. Did it really yes. happen? Because they are used to creating such dent in our confidence by infiltrating in our country and killing across people across the line of control quite frequently. So it was just uh, one of the instances where we did the same thing. What was the real difference? No, no. So the point, the, yeah. So the point I'm making is, and that's where I, I come to what, what are the lessons. I think we need to have a consistent approach towards, towards Pakistan. That if you really want uh, to look at it in a long-term perspective, and if you really want Pakistan to stop doing what it is doing, then there has to be an approach which combines your diplomacy, which combines your politics, which combines your military ac actions along the line of control to pass a consistent message to, to Pakistan. And not that uh, we go overboard in celebrating one operation. And then, you know, not, as I said, uh, behave in a, in a manner where we show some consistency in our policy. We have the ability to do it, as the surgical strikes have shown us. And I know we had a setback uh, in Balakot, as you said, uh, with one aircraft getting shot down, helicopter getting shot down. But I think the larger message of Balakot remains, which is we are willing to sort of up the ante if there is a major terror strike in India. And that message needs to keep sort of uh, continuously and consistently going on. I think that's the only way uh, to deal with Pakistan. Otherwise, as I said, uh, if, if the Kargil War and the 1971 war really haven't made them change their attitudes and behavior, you cannot expect one operation, one cross-border operation to do that. But certainly consistency in policy will help. Even the international agencies uh, have refused to, uh, you know, corroborate with conclusive evidence uh, any substantial damage inflicted by the Indian armed forces, uh, considering uh, the, uh, the, 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 the kind of extent of operation, the kind of nature and scope of operation. And then post the operation, uh, Pakistan refuted all claims made by India. That was obvious. But what about the international agencies? What about satellite imageries? What about all other evidences, what about Indian reporters crossing over the line to corroborate with conclusive evidence? Nothing suggested, to my knowledge. Probably you could highlight a few of them. Okay, so there was uh, there was uh, absolute evidence in the, in, in the sense that uh, uh, we had carried the video cameras, there were photographs, there were videos of every operation that was carried out. Uh, somehow, for some reason, and I know there was a discussion on this, uh, 
later uh, just after the operation that should we release this evidence or not or not uh, for some reason the government took a decision that uh, we will not release the evidence although i think it was uh, maybe 2 years later that some videos were uh, you know released i know because i got a call from i think it was times now or republic saying can you confirm that these are the same videos that were part of the but i think uh, you know in hindsight if we had released those videos immediately after the operation and particularly after pakistan army said nothing has happened i mean that would have really uh, sent a sent a strong message uh, for some reason i think as i said it was the government's decision uh, not to release on the numbers of people and terrorists killed i mean does it honestly matter if uh, it was 70 or it was 60 or it was 50 i mean what difference would it have made if it's 50 killed instead of 70 killed or something so i think numbers was not really uh, the purpose the purpose was to send the message that we can come across your territory and we will hit you and your terrorist camps in your own territory and it is not as if we are going to be defensive on our side and wait for terrorists to come that if they infiltrate we are going to tackle them we can tackle them even in your area i think that was the larger message uh, that that was meant to be sent up pakistan could use the same kind of an excuse uh, for doing the same thing officially what do you yeah, say so, to that? yeah so yeah sure, officially so. they do it but on officially if they start doing it because if we can cross over officially they can also start crossing over absolutely so we we need to be prepared look uh, after the surgical strike we were prepared in case pakistan army attempts or tries to do something we need to be prepared uh, however as soon as they came out and said look nothing has happened we we at that stage knew that uh, at least they are not contemplating any action now because they are just completely saying nothing has happened so what is the reason for them to react uh, but, but let me tell you it isn't as if uh, we did the operation and then just sat back and said look uh, there is no chance of pakistan army doing anything sure they 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 could have they could have tried to respond if they wanted to and we were prepared for it so that's where it was i, I mean uh, and but what what would you say to the uh international agencies and the reporters and all these people who all uh probably almost negated any such uh, and they were almost in sync with what the pakistan government said at the same time in balakot they also handed over abhinandan across the border with all the fanfare and the limelight and the and the uh, you know media glare international media glare uh, i mean it was uh, it was i mean i do not have words to express all that so you know we <laughs> uh, we do everything well somehow we are not good at uh, say handling the media or handling the information space uh, it's it's common knowledge and i am not saying that and everybody says that particularly in balakot we actually lost the narrative we actually lost the information sort of battle that was going on uh, in case of balakot as far as uh, the 2016 operation is concerned as i said uh, after 3 4 days pakistan took all the media the journalists and they i don't know where they took them surely they didn't take them to to the place where the actual strikes had taken place and said look look here nothing has happened on our side as i said um, and let me say this uh, you know up front here my recommendation at that stage was we must release uh, the footage what we have about the about the surgical site they were definitely better prepared general sir this time in 2019 their strategy was much better and it was clear and they played to the gallery perfectly as far as the international audience is concerned we also had a few setbacks i think see we had that helicopter shooting down and the nabinandan shooting 
and so you found for about 6 8 hours that day absolutely you know uh, no information to the media a lot of speculation going on uh, it was only in the evening that you know the official sort of uh, replies started coming in so in some ways yes we could have possibly uh, you know handled handled the media better the bet was laid down in pulwama and we succumbed to the bet they were prepared <laughs> i i wouldn't go as far i mean and, and as far as pulwama is concerned i think as you said uh, i had retired by then so i really don't have it's the same thing know, the, much, the analogy is yeah, the same yeah. it's between, between yeah. your uri and your this thing the analogy is the same uh, not, not really. Anyway, uh, the way Pakistan reacted to both the incidents was different. But uh, anyway, that's a you know that's that's a matter of uh, of of debate because in one case Pakistan completely said nothing has happened. In the other but case, they said it has happened. What but what is the next stage now? Because we've done one, they were ready. Second time, they had uh, I think probably they checkmated us, uh, uh, and then uh, now you know this will not stop. Personally speaking, you know, a dog's tail, it will not strip. Either cut it or forget it. So you cannot, you, you see, you have to live with a nasty neighbor. Either ignore him or finish him. Now, what do you say? I'm talking like a military man. What do you say? say? See, I'll tell you, you cannot ignore him. Uh, and nor should we think as a military man that it is going to be just easy to, uh, you know, finish uh, sort of Pakistan. After all, it's a big country. It has a strong military. It's a nuclear power. So, I mean, let's also not go, um, you know, either this or that uh, kind of route. My suggestion, and which I said earlier in the program is, let us sit down and make a consistent policy towards Pakistan. What is it that we wish to do? And how is it that we wish to achieve it? And the achievement of that policy is not going to come only uh, from one instrument of national power, but all instruments of national power. From our uh, politics, from our diplomacy, from international isolation of Pakistan, and from our actions along the border, I'm not saying rule out the military option at all, but have it as part of an overall strategy of what you want to and how you want to deal with Pakistan. Sometimes you want to be friendly, sometimes you want to be unfriendly. So is there, is there a consistency in our policy as far as Pakistan is concerned? It's something that I think the policymakers need to sit down and ask themselves. And try and follow a consistent policy at least. So let us also not forget that Pakistan is in both these instances. I, do, uh, I mean, they targeted our our forces in both the instances. It was not the civilians who were targeted. So that's different. They dented the morale of the forces. These poor young boys uh, who leave their villages and come to the borders. Suddenly, if they keep hearing about every year. 50 odd young friends of theirs being butchered in the wake of midnight, then it's something which is not very comfortable. You know, it's not a very comfortable situation. Uh, see, I, I, I have served on the line of control and on the border for a very, very long time. Uh, let me tell you, um, there is there is scope and there is enough retribution that is carried out to Pakistan army military also. It is not as if, uh, you know, we, that Pakistan military is completely hands off as far as the Indian army is concerned. So there is, there is enough that happens along the line of control. If something is happening to our soldiers, uh, a reaction, what to do, uh, does take place against the Pakistan army. In fact, uh, uh, if you recall, I think it was two years back when uh, the Pakistani Senate asked the Pakistan Army, tell us how many casualties you had along the line of control. And Pakistan Army refused to answer that question. 
they said we can't answer this because it could lead to a loss of morale so they are suffering uh, casualties or they were suffering prior to the ceasefire casualties along the line of fire so it isn't as if it's only our soldiers who are getting hit and then nothing happens to the pakistan army people that's not true sir my take away from this wonderful discussion with you is because it's a very closed door discussion and it is something which uh, we need to draw our lines very carefully this is a subject of immense national sub- uh, relevance especially when it comes from the mouth you know from the horse's mouth it comes from general ds huda the commander in chief of the surgical strike no we cannot uh, cross the borders as they say or as we are talking in in this case we have to take care of internal security as well uh, no surgical strikes are uh, you know recommended in our discussion because that can lead to a complete out and out all out war but at the same time sir the only thing i would suggest is as a young man who probably has and wants to see india not being you know disturbed by these uh, you know fools the only thing i would say is that stop this uh, diplomatic nuisance offense is the best defense before they, they you know make fear into their heart so that they stop because these people will not understand anything except for fear so you know that's the only way offense is the best defense thank you so much sir look to meet you again soon and jai hind namaskar and thank you so much for the wonderful surgical strike operation sir the nation shall be indebted to you thank you thank you very much and jai hind all the best